Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile artist Lisa Hinkemeyer. But first, joining me now is former Lieutenant Governor of North Dakota, Drew Wrigley. Drew, thanks so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. As we get started, tell the folks about yourself and your background, where you're from. Well, I'm a fourth generation North Dakotan and uh, born in Bismarck, grew up in Fargo, uh, attended the University of North Dakota, graduated with a degree in economics, and then on to law school uh, out in Washington, D.C. Uh, from there, I was a prosecutor in one of the largest DA's offices in America, in the Philadelphia DA's office, for a little over five years before my wife Kathleen and I moved back here to uh, Bismarck again in the late uh, 1990s. And, uh, and then uh, some years later, I was appointed United States Attorney by President Bush, confirmed by the U.S. Senate, and we moved to Fargo, where the main office at the time was in, there. And I served for a little over eight years as U.S. Attorney for North Dakota, the Chief Federal Law Enforcement Officer. And about a year after that, I went into the private sector, but that didn't, uh, didn't last long. I was appointed uh, Lieutenant Governor a couple years later and then elected to a full term in 2012. Mm -hmm. So I've spent the last six years as the Lieutenant Governor of North Dakota. Well, with that said, and maybe people see it obvious, how did you get involved in politics? Uh, you know, it's, um, I, have, I had a long interest, uh, you know, so many of us do, right? I was interested in public policy and, and watching politics and reading about policy matters uh, from a very young age, but really involved in politics it was only when I got back to North Dakota uh, in the late 1990s. I got involved as the executive director of the North Dakota Republican Party uh, for that cycle, the 2000 election cycle. Prior to being named the executive director, I had never been to an organized political meeting in my life. And uh, that was quite a lesson, but it was a, a great learning experience. And after that election, uh, our candidates, we had a really good run there in 2000. And uh, at the time, John Hoven got elected to his first term as governor. He asked me to join his staff as uh, the deputy chief of staff, uh, where I did serve for a year uh, before I took office as the United States attorney. John likes to joke that I, well, it's not a joke. It happened on our first day. I let him know that I was going to throw my hat in the ring to be U.S. attorney. And he looked at me and said, Drewski, it's our first day. Was it really that bad? So, no, it wasn't that bad, but uh, I appreciated uh, his support in that endeavor, and, and when President Bush appointed me and I was sworn in, uh, I, I began the next uh, eight years of service as U.S. Attorney, which is a tremendous privilege. Well, you know, was it a bit strange not being on the ballot, so to speak, in, in the uh, last election in November? You know, my entire professional life, I've been in and out of you know public uh, life, uh, both as a DA. It's not elected, of course. I was an assistant DA in a very large office, but as a prosecutor with public responsibilities, and then U.S. Attorney, not elected, but appointed and then confirmed. Um, no, it wasn't odd. I've been on the ballot one time uh, in my life and elected to my full term as lieutenant governor. So it wasn't odd, but uh, you, know, I, you know, I've had the last year to deal with it. It was a year ago, uh, about this time, made the decision not to run for governor and that I wouldn't be a candidate for office uh, in this cycle. So I've uh, you know, just been doing my job as we continue to do now. Okay. Well, there was a lot of speculation from people that you would run. So yeah. why did you choose not to? Yeah, politics is full of speculation uh, with what people are going to do and what they're not going to do. You know, it, these are always their professional and their personal decisions. And at the time, it was not the right time personally uh, for my wife and me and for our family. And, uh, you know, we've never questioned for a moment in the last year whether that was the right decision. It absolutely was. Um, it's an exciting time for us uh, and our family. In the last year, we've uh, we built a new house here in Bismarck. Uh, Kathleen started a new and exciting job. She's the guidance counselor at our kids' school and uh, loves that work. And so it was the first time in our uh, lives, uh, professional lives together, that uh, her job was uh, kind of leading the way. She got this great opportunity uh, here at Shiloh Christian uh, in Bismarck and where our kids go to school. And, uh, and then uh, I, I spent some time trying to find out what would be the right professional opportunity for me beyond the uh, lieutenant governor's office. Okay. Well, I understand your wife was a big supporter and backer yeah. of the measure called Marcy's Law, I guess. I forget right. which measure it was. Measure now. number three. Okay. And, uh, talk about uh, you know, what, what that measure meant and your reaction to the support it got. Hey, this is an outstanding effort by Kathleen and her team, and I'm incredibly proud. She, uh, Kathleen has been a longtime uh, advocate for victim rights. Uh, it goes back a long ways uh, from, her, from her personal life as a, as a much younger person. I shouldn't say much younger person, but when she was uh, 20 years old, her brother, who was 21 at the time, was a Philadelphia police officer, and he was killed in the line of duty. And uh, in the years after that, uh, Kathleen got involved. Uh, she's a counselor uh, by training, and she got involved with counseling families of murder victims, and it's just gone from there. She's been a lifelong uh, advocate on victims' issues and issues involving kids. Uh, and so um, when this opportunity came up, she was asked by the group that was sponsoring this whether she would chair the, the effort here in North Dakota to constitutionalize victim rights, to put them on equal footing with the rights that the defendants uh, have and that we, all, that we all respect and we all uh, recognize are so important. But victims have 
rights too, and that they should be on equal footing. And so Kathleen led this group, uh, lots and lots of work across uh, many, many months, getting the signatures together to get it onto the ballot. And they had many tens of thousands of uh, signatures, more than they needed. Uh, they had a good public information campaign. Kathleen was very active in that. She's an articulate and forceful sports, spokesperson for whatever issue she's working on. And I just, I couldn't be more proud. The kids and I, uh, we, we have heard a lot about Marcy's Law in the last year at our house. Uh, we, we started to tease her a little bit about it, but she knows all that's in good fun. And last night, it was, uh, it was, it was really fun to watch it, the, the, the votes come in and recognize that the people in North Dakota made a decision that they wanted to elevate victims' rights out of statute and put it into the Constitution so that victims have the right to be heard. They don't have the right to get their way when they're in the courtroom. They have the right to be heard. They have the right to be heard as to uh, sentencing. They have the right to be notified when there's an important matter coming up that they should hear about, whether it's a release hearing, a, a bail hearing of some kind, sentencing, um, resentencing, you name it. Uh, they, they have an opportunity to be notified and be there, and that should be constitutionalized, and now it has been because of the votes in North Dakota. So it was rewarding for two things. I'm, I'm proud of my wife. Uh, Kathleen and her team did a great job. I'm also proud of the people in North Dakota. They made the right decision, and uh, they're going to see that there'll be a seamless transition into the utilization of the constitutional protections for victims in North Dakota. Yeah. So really, where does the issue go? Basically, it starts into effect pretty quick. Starts, uh, yep, as soon as they certify that vote. Uh, this goes. In. Now, it's important to note that the vast ma majority of victims already are, are treated in a fashion consistent with what Marcy's Law provides. But it's such an important matter. These are such an important uh, set of questions that they ne it needs to be in place all the time. And it needs to be on that equal constitutional footing. I spent 14 years in courtrooms, both in the DA's office in Philadelphia, prosecuting crimes in one of the most violent cities in America, and then eight years here as the United States attorney. And uh, we take those issues very, very seriously. I recognize that uh, there's a lot of work and things that are incumbent upon prosecutors to keep victims up to speed and keep them informed. And it takes, it takes time. But we, are, but we already do those things. And in the federal courthouses, all the provisions of Marcy's Law, they're already followed here. If over, across eight years, I never had a problem. Our staff never had a problem. And across North Dakota, I'm quite confident in our state's attorneys and their outstanding staff and the victims' right advocates and the court system to be conscientious and to, and to do the right thing when it comes to these constitutional protections for victims. Okay. Well, as uh, I guess sort of we start a new year now, yeah. uh, what are your immediate plans for the future and is politics in, in them? Well, in the immediate future, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, uh, I'm not talking publicly about what exactly it is, but I've got an exciting opportunity that I've accepted uh, in the private sector with a, a business opportunity here. We'll be staying in Bismarck. Uh, as I mentioned before, Kathleen's got uh, her new job here at, over at Shiloh Christian as the guidance counselor, and our kids are there, and we, we love this community. This is our, you know, I've been here off and on my whole life. And so and this business opportunity is really exciting for me and for our family, and it's a good opportunity to do uh, what I recognize is really important work in the private sector here in North Dakota. So uh, be going into that. I'm taking a couple weeks off uh, after our term comes to a close on December 14th, and then I'll be starting right at the beginning of the year. Okay. Well, let's talk about uh, a little bit of the past maybe. Can, yeah. uh, talk about your six years as lieutenant governor uh, with Governor Dalrymple, and what were some of the issues you were heavily involved with? Well, uh, Involved, we really have a team approach there. I always, I'll recommend to anybody that, that it, uh, Lieutenant Governor is a fine job, but it helps a lot if the, uh, if the governor that you're going to be working with was himself or herself uh, a governor because he understood that, uh, you know, having that team approach makes the work uh, all the more interesting. And, and uh, you know, everybody in life, no matter what you're doing, you like to put your thumbprint on things, right? You like to feel like you're accountable for the things that are happening there. And it's been a real privilege to work at Jack's side on uh, budget matters across these years, the administration years, uh, the administration of state government here in North Dakota at an incredibly dynamic time when for most of those years, uh, North Dakota's economy was growing more rapidly than any state in the nation, our population uh, going up more rapidly than any state in the nation, and the list goes on and on. We topped off all those lists. And uh, it's not just, I don't put that out there just as a talking point, I put it to say this was a, and is a dynamic and exciting time in North Dakota and what a privilege to be able to serve as the 37th uh, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I've enjoyed working on issues of tax relief. Our administration can look back now on over $4 billion, $4 billion of tax relief across those years. We put uh, enormous public resources into the infrastructure of our state, uh, the roadways uh, becoming more safe, 
and uh, easier to conduct commerce all across the state of North Dakota, enhancing uh, the water systems, both providing water and water protection for floods, flood response to the devastating floods. Uh, up in mind, the list goes on and on. These have been uh, momentous times. Uh, there's a saying uh, that the Chinese uh, have, and they say it's a saying for their enemies, uh, may you may you live in interesting times. Uh, I, I'll tell you what, they can say that of us at any time. I would not, there's no other time would rather have served. Uh, these are interesting times and it's been a privilege to work on a host of issues. Also, one other thing I want to mention uh, that we worked on a lot in our administration. Uh, I picked up the reins on, on our state's quest to be named as one of the six test sites for unmanned air systems, drones. Uh, the FAA was going to name those uh, six sites, and uh, that effort was already underway when I got here, but I was able to help lead that uh, to a successful conclusion in our first couple of years in office. In the ensuing years, North Dakota has become an absolute leader in unmanned air systems. Uh, the safe integration of, of manned and unmanned systems uh, in the United States and across the globe, it's ex incredibly exciting. It ties in so well with our energy sector, with the ag sector, with our dynamic uh, aviation school and all the, all the av aviation sciences up in, uh, up in Grand Forks at the University of North Dakota. Then all the uh, testing and technology and from other institutions in the private sector, uh, startup companies trying to find solutions to problems in the unmanned air systems. This is the fastest growing component of aviation in North Dakota leads. Uh, that's really been a privilege uh, to work in that in that era. If I if I knew how to be a pilot, if I knew more about it, that's where I would go get a job in because I think it's really exciting and and watching that in the years ahead. Uh, I think uh, you know our administration we put a lot of resources into that, a lot of time, and they've done everything we can to really engender interest in that industry. And we're drawing people in from all over the globe to come here to run their tests and to engage with our private sector businesses. Well, you hit on some key accomplishments and achievements there as you talked about that, but. That's, you know, hindsight's always 2020, they yeah. say. So, but what about some of the issues looking back maybe you would have done differently? Oh, you know, I, I, I think it takes a little more time. I'm not trying to avoid that. I'll come back anytime and, uh, and talk to you about that in, in a little bit more in hindsight. I, I, I really do think that if you're working hard at, at this work in public life, if, if you make an error, you, you uh, recognize it pretty quickly and you do everything you can to try to solve that problem. You might be in the middle of a legislative session and some... some strategic matter that uh, maybe gets blundered in a, in a hearing that you didn't handle it quite right or whatever it might be or a floor vote doesn't go quite right and you need to amend it in the other house whatever you always can keep working to better that so I got to tell you leaving here after six years we look back and there's always things that you might have done differently but uh, we've, we've worked uh, assiduously across these years to uh, be self-correcting as we've gone along and to make sure we're doing what we can to provide uh, the necessary resources for infrastructure investments in the state, keeping our education system strong and getting stronger all the time, uh, making uh, higher education affordable and excellent in the state of North Dakota, and making sure that our tax system is fair, it's equitable, and that it's collecting as little in taxes as possible. Tax relief is not simply a talking point. When you have $4 billion in tax relief across those years, that's $4 billion staying out there in the private sector. That money is in businesses and in homes. It's families being able to use that money for their educational needs and for their, their health needs in their family or investing for their future. It's businesses expanding, creating more jobs. The list goes on and on. Those, uh, there are no ribbon cuttings for tax cuts. There's nothing standing there uh, that you can point to and say the government did that but it's one of the most important things is recognizing that you have to right size your regulatory and tax structure in your state so that businesses can bloom, bloom and grow and that people can have the most liberty possible with the money that they so, so work so hard to earn. So we're proud of those achievements and I think you've got a lot of, like I say, infrastructure investments that will benefit this state for the next 50, 60 years. Those are lasting investments. The roads are safer, uh, the water, uh, both water being provided and then being uh, flood protection and other matters. Um, as I said we've been blessed by resources in our state. We've got uh, vast amounts of water, it's just not always in the right place and we've got to find ways to move it around so that it can benefit the private sector, commerce uh, and uh, human life. Well, can you talk some about, you know, uh, budget cuts were, uh, had two rounds of budget cuts last year. Can yep. you talk about why that had to take place? Yeah, the, uh, there was an economic slowdown. We're still in the midst of that and, uh, you know, we're a heavily commodity-based uh, economy, uh, both in agriculture and then also uh, in the energy sector. That's not a mystery to anybody, but there was a confluence of uh, a price downturn both in the ag sector and in energy, and as a result, a, a very rapid decline in drilling activity and the, and the uh, other activity going on in the oil fields, the gas fields out, out west uh, largely, and then, like I say, commodity prices on the farms dropped. 
uh, precipitously. As a result, the economic activity slows down a lot. So there is a lot, a uh, lot of decline in, in the revenue to the government. And when that happens, North Dakota has, uh, you know, we've got one of those constitutions that requires a balanced budget. That's in our DNA anyway. I always say you wouldn't even need it in the constitution. We would do that in North Dakota. But when that's the case, when you're getting into your uh, biennium and you recognize that you're no longer balancing, your revenue stream isn't living up to what it was projected to be, and our, and our revenue stream gets projected, you know, it's not Drew and Jack don't sit down and say, oh, we think it'll be this. It's all the experts and the economists and the international forecasters come in and help give you those numbers. But that's a kind of a side issue. When that revenue stream falls short, for whatever reason, you got to find a way to go through an allotment process, which just cuts, cuts the agency budgets across the board. So that's what was done on a couple of occasions, had to adjust for that lowering, uh, lowering revenue stream. And we've been able to do that seamlessly here in the state of North Dakota. Uh, as a result, um, you know, that takes some creative uh, work to, to make do with less than the legislature gave different agencies. We've been able to do that and continue to provide excellence uh, in services uh, through our uh, different, different entities that are out there. One area that we're getting uh, a lot of pressure right now, of course, is in law enforcement. And uh, millions of dollars are being expended uh, to deal with the, uh, the protests uh, down south of Mandan that have now reached into a few months here and have been very, very expensive to combat the lawlessness of what became an unlawful protest down there. All the unlawful activity, the projection of that violence and unlawful activity out into the uh, countryside and the farms and the ranches and uh, the, the work sites for the, for the pipeline itself, uh, that's become very expensive. But we've been able to meet those resources for a lot of... A lot of reasons, not the least of which is money set aside into rainy day funds uh, wisely by previous legislatures, putting it out there so when the rainy day comes, either because of the slowdown in the budget, which has happened, you can infuse some of those dollars, or if you have an emergency come along like we've had with the pro pipeline protests and all the violence associated with that, you've got the millions of dollars that it takes to combat that. You know, some people uh, may ask, uh, if, if so much money came in during the boom, uh, where did it go or where is it? And you've given us part of that answer, maybe. Yeah. No, I'm, I, it's a great question. And I think when they look back at our administration, they'll know where that money went. The, it went into largely into billions of dollars in infrastructure investments in the roadways uh, across the West, uh, the bypasses for the communities out there to restore quality of life, into airports, uh, into higher education, into uh, K through 12 school uh, expansions, into property tax relief for the for the property tax owners uh, or property uh, owners across the state of North Dakota. Tangible, uh, tangible investments of the public dollars for lasting good. I think, uh, as I said, the next 50 or 60 years are positively benefited by those investments. Well, what do you think the outlook for North Dakota's economy is? I think it's very solid, very solid. We've got the we've got the best farmers and ranchers in the nation. They're productive, they're efficient, they produce, produce excellent uh, uh, commodities. I've traveled the globe as the head of the North Dakota Trade Office on a number of trade missions and have been very, very proud to uh, be representing North Dakota's interests as we try to find markets uh, all across the globe. And I'll tell you what, they love their partners from North Dakota because they know that they're gonna provide excellent, uh, res uh, excellent uh, commodities and they know they're gonna have top quality and they're gonna have honest people to deal with. So that's been, uh, that's, uh, those are the underpinnings of it. An energy sector, the, the growing technology sector, it's a diverse and diversifying economy and the future is very bright. Good. Well, we're, we're almost out of time, but real quick, Doug Burgum's administration going forward, just getting started. Yep. I don't, do you have anything to say? What do you think about that? Well, I've known Doug for uh, 15, 16 years, and I've known his Lieutenant Governor uh, Brent San uh, uh, Sanford for mm -hmm. uh, six years, across my years as uh, Lieutenant Governor. I tell you, these are two, these are bright, uh, energetic, uh, innovative thinking people who are going to be fully engaged in this work, and I, I have high hopes uh, and expecting great things. And It'll be uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if they ever want to call on us for a resource, we're here because uh, we believe in the future of North Dakota very, very much. They're going to do a great job. I'm confident. Drew, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Even from a distance, the vibrant colors and bold brushstrokes of Lisa Hinkemeyer's art will grab your attention. But when you're close up, you'll get the extra surprise of finding out that these works of art are made not with paint and brushes, but with fabric and a sewing machine. A lot of times, I guess I'll, I'll start with a piece of fabric with nothing on it. I'll hang it on, on the wall like a canvas and I'll stare at it. And then, hard to explain, but it, the pencil kind of takes over.
When Bruce and I had the boys, we both decided that I would be home because our moms were home. I, I was adapting and I knew I had to find a hobby. And I, I was painting murals, you know, and I was familiar with art, but I ended up doing a quilt, a baby blanket, and I enjoyed it, but it was a little boring. And I lost interest, but I loved, you know, the sewing machine and the sound of the sewing machine and the fabric. There's just nothing like it. Kind of always had that with me, and then I was at a store. I seen a magazine that had said art quilts, and it was very foreign to me. And I picked it up and I bought it, and I don't think I've ever stopped. Like, I could just, like, do this all day. St. Francis was um, almost duplicated. I was looking at a, an old picture, and I loved it, and I wanted it to hang in my house, so I thought, perfect, you know, I'll, I'll get the fabric and see what happens. And then I just went about it with really no idea of what I was doing. I'm 100% self-taught, but as I was doing it, it kind of, everything kind of fell into place. The needlework with that quilt even, like when I was done, I set it down and I came back and I looked at it and I'm like, how did I do that? Like honest, honestly, like I can't believe that I just did that. That's crazy. And the excitement was there. Threads are really fun to pick out too. And they make a huge difference depending on what you're doing. Uh, as far as contrast and color, like, you can really make them pop. Kind of like a little bit of abstract, because I guess that my goal is never to be so real, and I don't really care for that look. I kind of like a little bit of, you know, fun in the work. I love to manipulate fabric. I don't think I've ever done, honestly, a quilt the same way. I've never, like, had all my colors picked out nice before I've started and had a plan, you know, on steps that I do. I grew up in the woods. Mom and Dad had a lot of land. We planted trees. Nature was secondhand. Trees, to me, I kind of, like, have always admired trees. My idea is to do a tree and kind of a calmer background. I can't quite pin like the exact first tree I've ever did, but it came very naturally and very easy. I personally, I see a sky with land. And, you know, for a quicker quilt, use the fabric to your advantage. Prior to quilting them, I would go out in the woods, set up my easel, and I would paint trees. It had obviously dawned on me, why don't I just paint on fabric? Fabric and canvas are so similar. I started like taking the fabric and wrapping it around a flat surface to put on my easel. And I would paint the trees on the fabric. Once I got it home, it kind of gave me an idea of what I was going to do with that quilt. The majority of it is layered over with fabric. I tried to apply fabric as I would paint, you know, with a paintbrush. I've always admired art of all kinds. Van Gogh, I was 35 years old before I really knew who he was or learned anything about him because his work didn't really interest me as a younger person, yet thinking, you know, with my sewing machine, I'm looking at his brush strokes and like his colors. With a sewing machine, could you imagine? It just flows. And I knew that I could do that with fabric. I was doing an, a, a little show in St. Cloud and a teacher had walked up to me and she had so much excitement. She's like, it just flows, it just flows. And she was so excited about it I'm like, that's how I feel. Like, that's how, when I was doing it, it was just like, it's, 
you know, that's Van Gogh. There's some excitement there. My art personally has always been a feeling thing. And to explain it, I don't know that it would be possible. There's a knowing, there's something there and I, it's 100% it's a feeling thing. And when I'm, you know, in that zone, there's nothing I love more. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funding for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>